He said something that I remember. He said something about how all racists like make exceptions. Mm-hmm. That the was they super like. yeah. interesting yeah. because it's yeah. so true. Like they can have a Jewish friend because he's not like one of those yeah. Jews. Jonathan, we were really early to taking the extreme right seriously in Canada. Mm-hmm. And that involved like some icky work on your part. Like you actually had to like pay for paywalled access to these like racist videos and like. Yeah, and it was before we had our automatic transcription software. So I was just transcribing paragraphs and paragraphs of some awful stuff. But I mean, that would be a post because like, here's what they're saying when not everyone's listening. None of that necessarily goes as far as what Daniel Lombroso did. No. I mean, he embedded with some of the worst people for a long time. And I think kind of became a confidant and friend to like. Lauren Southern mm-hmm. and Richard Spencer Richard and Spencer. Mike Cernovich. I mean, it was a cinema verite approach. He just wanted to go in and just let the camera roll you know, to the point where they would forget the camera was there as they went about their day, which would be everything from, you know, the outright white supremacist stuff to doing household chores. White Noise is a good movie. And I think this was a really good conversation. Um, it was a good chat with Lombroso because, uh, I felt like we were in a good position to ask him some questions of just about like, what does that do to you? And what is your, like, how do you feel when like Mm. these people have you on like speed dial? I found the whole thing just so weird and uncomfortable. Like it felt like I was listening to things I shouldn't even be hearing. Yeah. I ended up watching the movie right after and it was just like, oh, like it felt uncomfortable. I'm glad that it inspired you to watch his film. His film's great. Yeah, it was. Okay, so here it is. Here's my conversation with Daniel Lambroso embedded with the racist right. You remember these assholes? What happens when you get a Muslim majority in France, what happens when you get a Muslim majority in in London? You have these places that are literally being conquered. There's a fine line between free speech and hate speech, and political activist Lauren Southern has no problem with it. Richard Spencer, the man who coined the term alt-right, wants an awakening of identity politics, meaning white identity politics. America was, until this past generation, a white country. It is our creation. It is our inheritance, and it belongs to us. We used to cover those assholes, and other assholes just like them. And our coverage was largely about meticulously sifting through everything that they ever put on the internet, which was shitty, shitty work. The reason we did that is because those assholes back in 2015, 2016, 2017, they were trying really, really hard at the time to not look like assholes. They cleaned up all pretty and toned down their rhetoric, and some of them were actually getting booked on mainstream media panels. They were being taken seriously as a new generation of conservatives with some edgy new ideas. And anybody who called them Nazis or racists or fascists or anyone who just socked one of them in the jaw, well, they were the ones who ended up looking like the extremists. So it made a lot of sense at the time for us to do deep dives into the archives of those assholes to find out what they really think and what they had really said when they figured that they were talking to like-minded people, when they weren't on primetime national television. Well, no shocker, we found stuff. And we reported it out so that if anybody in a newsroom on a tight deadline was thinking that, you know, maybe Lauren Southern or Gavin McInnes or Faith Goldie might make that evening's panel a little more edgy, well, a quick Google search would let them know who they're really putting on the air. Don't say that we never told you. I think it worked. You know, our stuff, along with other exposés, and then, of course, Charlottesville happened, and then Trump lost, and then there was deplatforming, and then there was the insurrection on Washington, and it seemed like the goblins had been pushed down again back into their toilets, and so maybe there's really no need to be talking about them again right now. Daniel Lombroso disagrees. He used to be a journalist with The Atlantic. Currently, he's with The New Yorker. And while we were suffering through the unpleasant task of watching all of that racist media, he was embedded physically with those racists. He spent four years off and on following around, with their permission, Lauren Southern and Richard Spencer and Mike Cernovich as their stars rose and as they traveled the world, spreading their increasingly popular messages. By the way, 
Daniel Lombroso is a Jew. The result of those four years is his documentary, White Noise. Lombroso says that if we turn our attention away from those assholes and away from the brief media love affair with them, we do so at our own grave risk. Daniel Lombroso joins me in a moment. Wait for it. Hi, Daniel. Hey. I kind of needed a shower after I watched your movie. I, I can't imagine how it must have felt to hang out with those people as much as you did. Yeah, there's a, there's sort of a, a de- like a delay in the processing. You know, I, I, purely because The Atlantic, which of course is this prestigious magazine, this is their first film. There was never a lot of money. So it was, okay, Daniel, you're on to the story. We bought you a camera, go. So it was, I was running sound, I was shooting it. I'm the cinematographer, I'm the co-producer, I had help from amazing people. But, you know, in the field, it was mostly me or sometimes with an assistant. I think for that reason, I know this sounds weird, but there was very little space to process. It's really only the past six months or a year, once I've, you know, been in post-production, you know, wrapping the film that I've looked back. And yeah, the, the, it was filled with just, you know, in, epically fucked up moments that uh, I will have to think about in, you know, in the years to come. The film is just the tip of the iceberg. I went to wet a wet in all. I went to Jack Posobiec's wedding. He's the guy who basically invented Pizzagate. You know, I uh, went to like private parties where there was you know ample drug use, and you know was like, dealt with Nazi salutes and anti-Semitic language to my face. We, you know, I was in Russia for ten days with Lauren Southern. You know, meeting not only the people in the film, but real Kremlin sycophants and oligarchs and all of these weird people. You, you, you are you're a, you're subhuman to them. Right, you don't fit into their plan. If necessary, you, you and me both need to be violently removed from the picture. For them, we'd both have to move to Israel because that's the only choice. On it. I know I don't mean to be facetious, but you know the notion is that you know I don't mean to bring in a whole other charge debate, but Jews to white nationalists are not considered white. They have a very traditional understanding of Judaism, which is the perennial outsider, like they were in the European context. And if you talk to a white nationalist about the place of you know Jews in society. They say, we wish you the best and you should go to your country. And their, their understanding of that is Israel, which is complicated and problematic for a lot of reasons. All that goes to say is that I'm, I'm definitely subhuman to Lauren and Richard, less to Mike. But, and this is a, an important but, all racist movements make exceptions for people they like. And I think these people came to like me, came to look forward to seeing me, and they made an exception for me in the same way Lauren made an exception for her partner, the way Mike made an exception for his partner. Thomas Jefferson had had kids with a slave and, you know, many Nazi officials had relationships with, with, with Jews, even though they murdered, you know, two thirds of, of the Jews in Europe. So it's very, very common for, for racist movements to make exceptions, even for the people that, like you said, they consider subhuman. Well, the, the exception they made for you is a bit different than the ones they did for others, because you were a Jew with a camera. A, a Jew with a camera that I, I still cannot figure out why they let me uh, follow them with that camera for that long. I'm not especially religious, but I'm very proud of my background. It's a huge part of my identity. And, you know, I never I never hid it from them. And I think in maybe a, a weird way, they they had respect for me because of that, that I had the balls to, to be straightforward. You embedded with the extreme right for four years. How did you do that? How did you get access? It was a long and slow process. I mean, I spent weeks getting access to Richard Spencer, months getting access to Mike Cernovich, and really a year getting access to Lauren Southern. She never does the kind of press that she does in the film, you know, an all access portrayal, really understanding her, her complexity, and ultimately for all three characters, the contradictions and hypocrisy at the hearts of their world. The goal of the film from the beginning was to gain unprecedented access into the alt-right. And by doing so, I think to expose two main things. One is kind of the naked racism that still shapes so much of our societies, both America, but also Canada, but also, you know, the glaring contradictions that all these individuals exude. It was my goal really to, to really, you know, dismantle and, and demystify their public persona by showing that in private, they contradict themselves constantly. And we can talk more about that. But, you know, I think being, you know, from an ostensibly liberal publication, The Atlantic was challenging. I'm also Jewish. I'm, I'm the grandson of, of two Holocaust survivors, my, my dad's mother and my mom's mother. You know, I didn't lead with that. <laughs> um, my last name sounds Italian. It's a long story. We changed it 100 years ago. So that gave me a little bit of cover as well. 
And I think ultimately what it was, was just, you know, being persuasive, being persistent and, and, you know, really being clear eyed that to, to make this film right, I had to really get unprecedented access. I had to keep coming back and keep knocking on the door. And I just did that again and again and again until, you know, I started ending up with these insane situations in Orange County with Mike Cernovich and his wife at the European Parliament with Lawrence Southern. You know, I just kept knocking on the door until eventually I, I ended up with, uh, with a feature length film. The fact that you had an agenda to dismantle their hypocrisies couldn't have been a huge surprise to them. I'm not going to accuse you of betraying them in any way, but there is just like an aspect of like Lauren Southern almost seems to come to rely on you as like some kind of a confidant or something. Dynamics that are familiar to me in journalism, especially when you're doing long form stuff where you're embedded with people where, you know, you kind of hope that they forget that you're there to observe them and maybe even to observe them from a point of view. I've been thinking for a while about stepping away from the political YouTuber life. I, I kind of entered this world a little bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, expecting everyone to do dealings honestly and to tell the truth and to be upfront with what they wanted, and that's really not always the case. Being in this crazy, crazy world of where fame and money and politics all exist and meet, I realized a lot of things that I probably should have been more horrified by and more critical of had just become normal to me. Given what she was experiencing at the time, who were you to her in those moments? I was always a journalist and, and never a friend. And I think it's important that that line is very clear here for you in the podcast, but also more broadly for people watching at home. I mean, we approached this with the journalistic rigor of an Atlantic Magazine cover story. So that meant going through a rigorous fact check, a legal review, going through dozens, probably hundreds of edits. I mean, at one point, like every schmuck in New York City was giving notes on this thing. You know, it was really about doing our due diligence, making sure that we were rock solid, that we were accurate. I'm a documentary filmmaker first and foremost. I think a lot of documentaries that take things for granted really can bend and mix reality. You know, they'll take a cutaway from a different scene and throw it there. They'll, they'll create, you know, meanings that didn't exist. And it, it was very important for us to really capture this movement to create a historical document. And that's what the relationship was like with Lauren. She was going through a vulnerable period and I was there to listen. I was there to ask questions. I was there to prod and to push. And you, and, and you see a lot of that in real time in the film, but she's ultimately a subject. And I covered her in the way I would cover any other subject, whether it was, you know, Barack Obama or anyone in the world. She had no power over the images. She never saw cuts. And, you know, anytime she would try to, to try to break that line in some way to try to be friends with me. For instance, they rented a space. They were at an Airbnb in France. And they say, hey, Daniel, why don't you sleep on the couch? And I'd say, you know, Lauren, I'm going to stay nearby at my own hotel and I'll see you in the morning. And, you know, it was important just to always keep that, keep that line crystal clear. At the same time, to some extent, I did become a kind of confidant to her. And that's her own doing. When she said something is off the record, that was honored 100%. And there are many things that she wanted to keep private that were kept out of the film, that were kept out of my reporting. But when she's talking to me in my capacity as a journalist on the record, she has to understand, even though she's young, that these are things that will end up, you know, being consumed by people in the Atlantic and, and, and more broadly. And it can be difficult to see herself so vulnerable on camera. I think she had an opportunity with that vulnerability to actually redeem herself more than she ultimately did. I mean, she had a chance to really lean into it and, and apologize, but... She ultimately didn't, and, and that's why, you know, she doesn't come off as, as likable as maybe she could have in the end. So this is a boat called the Aquarius that has been illegally bringing in migrants from the Libyan Ocean for the last while, and they're just heading out again to bring in more illegal migrants, and we are going to stop them. No way they're coming in here. No way they're bringing in more illegals. We are done. So guys, if the politicians won't stop the boats, then we'll stop the boats. No more! No more! Illegal immigration! No more! No more! Illegal immigration! No more! You know, let's just be clear here. It's hard to have any sympathy for the idea that she's being manipulated. She's looking for the attention, and you you document her in the act of manipulating others in incredibly egregious ways. This scene where she's 
driving around Paris looking for people to to misrepresent and exploit, basically. And we watch the whole process play out where she she's looking to document that refugees and immigrants are uh, exploiting this society. And she finds some people in a little tent enclave under a bridge. And she uses cigarettes and chocolate and, and, and lies to them about who she is. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Alex. I want to know your story. I want to understand your story. I'm learning a lot about uh all the people here in Paris that have come here for a new life. You know, you're watching somebody practice journalism in, in you know, a, a, a really egregious and exploitative way. So that and a hundred other things make her not sympathetic. And yet the sheer, the sheer experience of watching like this child, and she does come across as a very, in many ways, naive person in the midst of this whirlwind where she's surrounded by very hateful angry and, and and maybe even violent people certainly misogynists there's a sense that she's leaning on you at, at times i've had some scary experiences some heroes that have fallen for me i've certainly gotten a shorter fuse for this nonsense of everything is women's fault Sexual assault is a very real thing. There are, certainly are power dynamics within the business world where women have to be careful. This is something that I've really learned is the only one that can really protect me is me. And I think women are having to learn a lot of hard lessons when it comes down to it. You are, you are sometimes your first and last defense. You did, though, start your career with a lot of anti-feminist commentary. Do you ever have moments where you look back at that early work and say, maybe you played a role in that mentality? Hmm. I don't disagree with what anything that I've done. I think I've been honest, but uh, the, the lack of nuance and qualifiers and extra explanations can really hurt a debate when people interpret what you're saying differently than how you wanted it. That is something that, that I, I wanted to ask you about, how she came to kind of rely on you and, and you know, how you felt about that. Well, I think the Paris scene in particular is is an egregious example of the kind of work that Lauren Southern, you know, Rebel Media at large, Faith Goldie, many of the people that I know you're familiar with on the podcast, that's what they purvey, that's what they practice. They look for images that validate their pre-existing worldview. I, I think it would be good today just to see the camp. It'd be really cool. Looking only only for migrants people or for, uh, I mean, illegal migrant people? Illegals, yes. Okay. Right there. You see the fire? Oh shit, yeah, this is a great shot if you can get this. Oh, there's a bunch of tents under, oh shit. That's a whole tent area down there. Yeah, they've got a ton of tents if we can go under that bridge. You know, it's, it, it, if you haven't seen the film, it's a really devastating scene of these African asylum seekers who are boxed out of life in France. They they had an arduous journey across the Mediterranean Sea. They somehow arrived in Paris. They can't get a job. They don't have much to eat. There's rats scampering beneath their feet. Lauren Southern comes under the pretense of being a reporter, right, with a fake name, Alex. But what she's actually doing is manipulating them to create a white nationalist propaganda film that she ultimately screens at the European Parliament for all these far-right um, ministers and, you know, shows them as people who are, you know, coming ultimately to destroy the fabric of, of Western civilization, which really means which really means white civilization, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and colleagues, welcome to this screening of Lauren Southern's very important film. It's the film that the mainstream media have dared not to make and will not make, so we have to do it. And so much of like the work of the film is to show the way that these people shape narratives that they're so skilled at, at building a, a story about Western decay that doesn't actually exist. And that's that's another part of the film and the filmmaking process is to dismantle that as well. And I think you see that in the difference between my camera, what I captured with Lauren and you know her camera and what she showed at the European Parliament and with the film, which was viewed a million times, you know, she raised more money for that thing than I probably spent on all of White Noise. To your point, I, I you know, I I don't know why she leaned on me to that extent. I think Part of it is that I'm, I'm only a few years old, older than her. I'm also a young filmmaker. I, I typically work alone. So unlike big doc crews, which could be really intimidating and you don't get that intimacy, you know, I was alone with her in, in Russia and in, and in France and in Belgium and in Vancouver and Toronto. And sometimes there was a shooter or someone helping me. But, you know, when you spend that much time with anyone, eventually 
you know, the guard comes down and the layers come down and Lauren, Mike and Richard are very press savvy, especially the first two, but they don't understand Verite documentary. The stuff they make is like, gotcha, you know, Jordan Peterson shouts at whatever. They've never participated in a film like this. They've never made a film like this. They didn't, I think they never really understood that when you spend this much time with such an important subject, you know, ultimately the evil will, will, will shine through in the end. Once again, accepting that you, you, you maintained your professional lines, but did you come to sympathize with her in any way? Did you come to feel like friendly towards her? There's, there's moments with her, for example, when you catch this moment, Gavin McInnes, after she appears on his show, where he's just a, horrible to her, and then he's propositioning her. Gavin goes on and on about family values, and then he, you know, he's you know, very crudely trying to get her in bed. Hey, what did I forget? I'm good. We shouldn't be talking about this at all. <laughs> I was I was pretty drunk too. I, I can't, I honestly, I just remember going to sleep. See, the thing is like, I, I because my moral compass tells me you have a wife and kids, it's not even in my realm of consideration. If, if it makes you feel better, you're a very handsome and successful man. I'm about to get out of the airport here, but thank you for having me on your show. It was lovely, and uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gav. Bye. <laughs> Send help. He's like, oh. He's like, still trying. She does seem at a certain point like just surrounded by all the sexual hostility and you kind of can't help but feel like protective or some sort of like uh, a sense of danger for her as a viewer of your film anyhow. And to give you even more context in the film, you see Lauren receive the call. I wrote a longer story for The Atlantic where you learn what Gavin says. And he said on the call, I don't know if I can say this on the podcast, he said, you know, you want to fuck me, I'm your childhood hero, which is disgusting. And no one in the world deserves to go through that. You know, no one deserves to, to deal with sexual harassment or abuse or any of that. The tricky part is that Lauren and many of these other, you know, far right women perpetuated many of the beliefs that then come back to bite them. You know, one of Lauren's first ever videos, one of her first viral videos was going to a, a, a feminist march in Vancouver holding a sign saying there is no rape culture in the West. No means no! No means no! My sign means that this is not a rape culture because rapists go to prison here. Rapists are fired from their jobs. Men who make rape jokes are fired from their jobs. Go to Africa and you will see a real rape culture. You know, there were feminist marchers, some sexual assault survivors there. And she had this intuitive understanding of right-wing media and the web that if you do the most provocative thing possible, go to a feminist march and say something anti-feminist, you'll take off online. It really puts you on the map if you're willing to espouse views that the world find quite shocking. It gets a lot of clicks to be contrarian. You know, that video has three million views, inspired a lot of her later work. It helped her, you know, really rise quickly at Rebel Media. I think she was 19 or 20 when she put that out. So, you know, that makes it a lot harder to sympathize with someone like that. You talk about the intent of the film to dismantle these ideologies. For some viewers, these ideologies are already dismantled. I think a lot of people who are watching this documentary from the Atlantic Monthly about white nationalists, most of your audience, I would hazard, already finds those ideas reprehensible. The interest for me, in large part to your film, is, is just the, the intimacy and the level of um, exposure. What are these people actually like? And how can they live with themselves and live in the world? Maybe the strongest moment for me, or a moment I can't stop thinking about, where after that Lauren Southern gets her gotcha moment, and in order to do that, she has to actually have conversations with all of these men who are, like, starving, and, you know, they're homeless, and they're stateless, and she gave them the chocolates and the cigarettes to get them. But they didn't talk for that reason. They talked because some of them said, well, maybe something good will come out of this, and because they had been fooled into thinking that maybe this was a legitimate journalist. And you see her kind of like grappling because she knows what she's going to do with that footage. She's sort of like having this conversation with herself, like, well, yeah, I guess they're humans. Because I hear their life story, that doesn't mean we suddenly, just because I feel bad in that moment, we need to destroy all borders and allow everyone to come in here. Uh, it, that, it doesn't work like that. Everyone's got, a, everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a heart. I mean, they're all people, but... Um, it's just an overall bad situation for everyone if you don't try to have some order 
to it all. It's chilling. It's a very powerful moment. It's, you know, in a way, the film simulates the emotional roller coaster I was going through. So that's, you know, towards the end of Act Two in the film, which is about a year into filming with Lauren. It's after she was dealing with all the sexual harassment that you see in the film. It was around that point when she started dating the individual who became her husband. And you, you learn in the film to pretty damning effect that he's he's mixed race, that she ends up with a mixed race partner, even though, you know, for the past four or five years, she's been fighting to preserve white demographic majorities in, in the US and Europe. And, you know, watching her, you know, be with that partner, dealing with that abuse, I think there was the hope that she would change. And that moment in the car, I was sitting there in suspense, just like you are as a viewer, thinking, Lauren, come on, here is your chance to to say sorry, to make amends, to feel sympathy. But I think you see in her brain kind of in that moment, and it was very important not to cut away. It was important to sit with her. She starts to have a little bit of sympathy and then something just goes back in her, in her mind. She realizes that she can't do it, whether it's that her audience will never accept her if she changes, that she's captive to her base, or maybe she's just not sorry, you know? She, she could have had a way out of the movement. She ultimately didn't. And there's never going to be a reckoning. There'll, there'll never be accountability. You know, Lauren Southern is a product of white privilege. She's a, a middle-class girl who can, who can purvey such dangerous ideas, can incite violence, and then ultimately walk away from it. She now lives very comfortably in Australia with her partner and her kid. She has a cushy gig on Sky News, which is like the Fox News equivalent there. And, you know, she never had to deal with any of the consequences of, of, of the work that she did. Why do you think she asked you to hide the fact that, that her then boyfriend and later husband and her kid's dad, why do you think she asked you to hide the fact that he's not white? Your current boyfriend is not white. I, I don't think it would be endearing to put such an emphasis on that, you know, because it doesn't matter to me. I think she understands and it's something she'll never admit but it's obvious to any viewer that it's a glaring contradiction of everything that she stands for. If you were dis to distill down what is the one thing, you know, an alt-right avatar, a white nationalist, you know, could not do, should not do, what's the line? It's end up with someone who's not white. I mean, women have a very important role in white nationalist movements. It's to be baby makers. It's to preserve the white race by having as many kids as possible, right? She understands that role, even though she doesn't really practice it as she's an, in a way a kind of feminist and that she's ambitious, she's traveling the world, she's making films. She still sees her role as being domestic first and foremost. And of course, she betrays that by ending up with someone who's not white and, you know, having having a kid. And the cognitive dissonance is just completely un, is unreal. And that's why it was so important in the film to just sit with her in that moment after she says it. You, you might remember it's like 10 or 15 seconds where... She takes a sip of water and we're just sitting with her because you see on her face that she knows and she does know, but she just can't admit it because it would it would harm her brand so, so dramatically. You are the person who she texted to ask, hey, Daniel, in your honest opinion, do you think I'm irredeemable and can't go back to a normal life? What did you text back? You know, I was always cautious. I worked with the assumption that they were always recording me. And you have to understand how stressful that is, spending three, four years, hundreds, probably thousands of hours with them. Inevitably, you slip up. You say something that, if taken out of context, could be perceived as this or that. But when she sent that, I remember very clearly, I thought this could be a trap years from now. So I remember saying something like, like, you know, Lauren, this is a much more complicated question. Let's talk about this next time we meet. Because I didn't want to give her an answer. I was there to listen, you know, when things were especially bad with the sexual harassment, I was there to say, Lauren, this is, you know, you don't have to deal with this. I'm sorry as, as a human, but I was never there to support her emotionally. And that was a pretty clear red line for me. And I, I'm, I'm positive that I didn't validate her in any way there. And what did you think the gotcha would be? What were you afraid if you responded the wrong thing, what would come back and bite you? What would be, what would the wrong answer be? You know, White Noise is a risky film. I, saw the trends behind, you know, President Trump's campaign and victory in the surging right wing media ecosystem from Breitbart to Rebel. You know, I was pretty early on that beat and it was important for me to cover it, to be clear eyed, to really get into the belly of the beast. But inevitably you run into all these complicated questions around platforming, around, you know, are you are you emboldening them? And I, I really strongly believe the film does not. It shows them as being pathetic and vulnerable and hypocritical. But it, it was very important for me not to give anyone uh, fodder for that belief. You know, like if there was 
a text or a call where I was like, Lauren, I'm, I, you know, I, I love you. I'm here to support you. I'm invested in your growth. Sometimes you see journalists do that sort of thing to get a story. And, you know, it, it was a very clear line in a, in a way, a, a way to protect the reputation of the film and all the work that I was doing. There's so many more people in the story of this person who are more worthy of, of sympathy. And yet I did feel like, what are you doing? You've got a long life ahead of you. And I, I, I see that you're getting lots of likes, but you got to live for a bunch more decades. You know, I think you have to understand the social media and this ideology is, is like a drug. I mean, it's, it's intoxicating when you're around people like Lauren and Mike, the two of them especially. They're Internet celebrities who happen to be racists. I don't mean to exonerate the racism in any way but they move with the, the swagger of an internet celebrity and what motivates them, they, they really do believe in the preservation of white dominance in the US and Canada, but they're also equally preoccupied with the likes and the shares and the retweets and the feeling of celebrity. And you know, you see it with Lauren everywhere. Uh, she's walking, first she's walking through Dundas Square in Toronto being like brazenly racist. I literally could not see a single European face. Not only that, they were giving out free Korans and free henna in the tents on Canada Day, and it was just women in burkas with Canada flake burkas. They either assimilate or they go home. If they don't want to be a part of Western culture, why the hell did they come here? And then moments later, a young white kid comes up to her and says, you're my hero. Hi. Uh, Lauren, yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, I appreciate all, the, all your work. Oh, pleasure. I go to the point where I think you were on the Italian beach and you were like shoving away boats? <laughs> In Sicily, yes. I wasn't shoving away boats. I was uh, protesting and investigating, but thank you so much for watching. <laughs> yeah, well, I really appreciate it. And uh, you're one of the freedom warriors. Oh, there. thank you so much. Again and again, that's the sort of thing that would move her. And towards the end of the film, she says, you get a little high, quote unquote, every time you get a like or a share or a retweet. And it was very hard for her to step away from that. Racism has always been around and, you know, the U.S. and Canada were founded on the ethnic cleansing of Native communities and, you know, bringing Africans over here in slave ships. But what's different now is that that sort of ideology is a commodity that you can sell on, on social media. It's a way to get rich and famous. And Lauren Southern, you know, she when she did pull away momentarily, the high was gone. I mean, the intoxication that she felt was gone. She told me she was going to walk away from it forever. But like all, you know, to extend the metaphor, like anyone who takes drugs, you know, withdrawal is difficult and you crave it again. And, and ultimately she, she returned to the movement because she believes in the ideology, but also because she, she, her and all of these individuals need the validation that, that comes with it. From your perspective as an American, did, did you reflect at all on Canada's overperformance in this sector? We seem to produce a lot more of these goons <laughs> than you might think. Canada is certainly overperforming. And I say that as a proud McGill graduate. Uh, I lived in Montreal for four years. You know, everyone from Gavin to Stefan Molyneux, Lauren Southern, Faith Goldie, Ezra Levant. I mean, the list is insanely long. My kind of anecdotal feeling is that Canada does such a good job of teaching multiculturalism so much better than the U.S. I think there's a, a mosaic, you know, that it celebrates people from all backgrounds. In America, we learn about the melting pot, that you have to become an American. And, uh, you know, I think Canadians do such a good job teaching the history of natives, maybe not completely, but certainly better than the education I grew up with that you inevitably get a backlash. And I think for the 70, 80, 90% of Canadians, they're open-minded to this stuff. They appreciate multiculturalism, but the 10 or 20% feel targeted in a way that they might not with a, with a looser system like you have in the States. And that was kind of Lauren's origin story to some extent in the film and also in the article that she felt targeted as a white woman. But it's also the origin story of George Hutchison, who's her part-time boyfriend that she goes on a, we like to joke, the date from hell with in the film. They go on a date in Toronto. That's the guy who Lauren Southern goes on the date with who won't eat ketchup because it's ethnic food, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You read the article. That, 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 that part of the article went totally viral, was screenshotted. Like the, the origin of ketchup is somewhat unknown, but some people think it's derived from ketchup, which is a Chinese fish sauce, not quite ketchup. And because of that, he, he wouldn't touched the ketchup and he wanted to eat only at a, at a Western establishment. So we went to a British style pub um, in a wealthy part of Toronto. Dalai Lama says there are too many refugees in Europe. What a lad. See, Dalai Lama is a nationalist. I remember seeing a study that showed that people were happiest in North America during World War II. Fascinating. And lost, lost happiness, you know, as, uh, as things became easier. Kind of all of us Europeans, we have the responsibility to reproduce. It's 
very cold way of putting it. Is it more than a responsibility? Like, do you want to have a family for the sake of love or just because you think it's a duty thing? Well, I think, you know, having a family could be really difficult. I think if you go into it thinking, I'm, I'm doing this for the fun and the pleasure, I think that's the wrong motivation. I think your, the right mentality is to go into things thinking, I'm doing it out of duty. Like, it right. shouldn't be about personal pleasure or personal well-being. Like, that's not nationalist. That's not collectivist. But why, why would people do that? Why would people do something that is uncomfortable? Because it's beautiful. He claims he was targeted as a white man by the Canadian education system. And, you know, I heard that story many, many times with Canadians. It's what Gavin McInnes told me when I interviewed him. This pastiche that is whiteness to these people, like th that they're claiming, and this idea of the white ethnostate and, and what that means and what, what, like, the aesthetics of that feels so shallow and thrown together. To the, to the point of, of, of self-parody with Richard Spencer putting on like a like a Cosby sweater for his like Teutonic Christmas celebration in Montana. Like it's it's uh, <laughs> it's hilarious. That's something we would we would joke about that Richard especially is sort of a cosplay Nazi who in typical Hitlerian fashion is this is his great performance that he in a way is a failed artist who never had his moment. And I, it's a. I think a really important part of the film when, when you hear from him in voiceover that he dreamed of being an avant-garde theater director. I wanted to be a theater director and I wanted to do all this avant-garde stuff and that's how I thought of myself. I am an artist before I'm a politician. That doesn't mean that he doesn't believe this stuff, he does, but in a way this is the performance that he never had. I mean, he was a second-rate football player at his elite private school in Texas. He was a second-rate theater actor and director. And he finally had his moment in this movement. And yeah, the aesthetics are absurd. And you, you see that all over, but especially in Richard's world. I mean, it's it's the short shorts. It's like the Hitler Jugend haircut. It's like very consciously taking like the cheesy 20th century fascist iconography, Hugo Boss, all that stuff. And not even updating it, just putting it on again. He always has James Bond iconography everywhere. It's laughable. It's silly. But I think what's what's startling is that a lot of the boys, and I mean boys literally because he keeps younger kids in their late teens and early 20s around him. And uh, I see that you are all dressed in white. There's there is a dress code for tomorrow. You've got white shirts and khakis. White shirts are clean. They're, they're also hard to clean. <laughs> so it shows that you have, you put some thought into it if you can make sure you get all the sweat out of your collar and if you get dirt or blood on it, you have to you know, clean that out every time. So it's a good, uh, it's a good marker for people. You know, a lot of them love it. I mean, it gives them a sense of purpose, that they have a way to dress, a way to talk, a way to chat. They're all in group chats together. I mean, it, Richard's world of the three feels the most um, cult-like, actually, for that reason. I think the only actual critique of me is that I'm not elite enough. I, I don't want this to sound too grandiose, but I mean, I'm bigger than the movement. E everyone is a hypocrite and a liar in this thing. And you talk about um, the question of platforming. I guess the strongest reason why uh, I've felt in, in covering these things in the past, like, look, I don't want to give any oxygen to these people, but they are real. They are a threat. They're, they're powerful. And we need to understand them because they're liars and they, and they misrepresent themselves. In the early parts of your film, they're scarier than they are funny because it's working. And you caught that, that famous clip of, of Spencer's supporters throwing up the Sieg Hail. We willed Donald Trump into office. We made this dream our reality because for us as Europeans, it is only normal again when we are great again. Hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. We kind of meet them as their ascendant, as, uh, as they're riding the Trump wave. By the time you're done, it's very sad. And they're all ludicrous and ridiculous. And part of what, the aftertaste of the film is like, well, that was really well made. And I'm thinking about all these different things. And yet I wonder if this matters anymore. They're done. They've crested. It's, it's, it's kind of over. And it can be fun to kick them when they're down. But that's not such a worthwhile pursuit. I, I love your analysis and agree with most of it. The, the, point that, the part that I would add is that really the takeaway from the film, and I think there's a very powerful montage at the end that speaks to this, is kind of the cat's out of the bag. They've unleashed something into our society that we can't put back. 
you know, even though Mike Cernovich is now selling facial skincare products and Lauren Southern is in Australia and Richard Spencer is playing horrible Chopin renditions in his mother's mansion, the ideas that they've unleashed are now in the mainstream of the conservative movement in the United States. They've taken over the Republican Party. They're on Fox News every night. I mean, the sorts of things that Richard was telling me in 2015 and 2016, you know, that we have to crack down not only on illegal immigration, but on legal immigration, that we want net zero migration. He would talk about that. That's the notion that we kind of like a bar. You only let one person in when one person leaves. No one was, that was not our understanding of the immigration system at the time. And now you put on Fox News and it's, uh, uh, they talk about that all the time. Get rid of chain migration. We don't need family reunification. We should build a wall. Detention centers again and again, you know, in political science, there's a concept of the Overton window that there's a window of what's acceptable in discourse. And previous to Trump and previous to the alt-right, a lot of these notions were not acceptable. I would argue that the film says, and, and I would argue as a journalist, that as a result of this movement, the, the discourse has moved so far to the right that there's now space for political actors of all kinds to say not quite Richard Spencer, but definitely to say Mike Cernovich, you know, to say many of the ideas that he believes that basically at the core of it is that, you know, the white majority in the United States is at risk of disappearing and we have to stop that. I'm not an overtly political filmmaker or director, but the Republican Party in this country has been taken over by a populist nationalist element that resembles what we're seeing in places like Hungary and Poland with Brexit in the UK. I mean, that is the future of conservative movements. And I think the film says that just as strongly as it shows them being pathetic. We get the story of Lauren Southern that ends with her own her own base is turned against her with all these threats and condemnations that she's a, and that she's a hypocrite for who she ended up with. And watching her in your film, it does end in this kind of there is this sense of her patheticness. And, you know, you, you catch her. as She's trying to get away from these viral Internet clips and instead do these you know serious documentaries. And she, she slams her fist down on a map of Europe and there's reverb. Europe is a continent in crisis. In fact, Europe is a continent in the midst of several crises. It's always a laugh line when we screen it. It's like she's play acting at being a serious thinker. And uh, and, and I, I leave the film, I go like, like, how much attention do I really need to give to this person? I've given her too much attention so far in my mind. And then I look at the film online and she's getting millions of views for this thing. It was screened for the European Parliament. Lauren is like, when I was walking around the EU with her, she was treated like a head of state. And she's on Sky News? She's on Sky News. These people have followings in the millions. We can choose to ignore them, but it doesn't matter if Canada Land or the Atlantic ignores these people, they have their base. And that demographic, even post-Trump, isn't going anywhere. So, you know, the premise of so much of the work I do, and I think this comes from my from my grandparents having gone through what they went through, is to shine a light on these things. And, to, you know, I really believe my goal is to, is to raise awareness about these individuals and by doing so to, to, to weaken them. Lauren Southern's influence, Mike Cernovich's influence remains to some extent. And I think two of the two of them are complicit in the radicalization of thousands of kids. I mean, so many people in Canada and America grew up in the last decade exposed to, you know, Lauren's flashy, high production value, racist and anti-feminist videos. And that can lead you to all sorts of directions. Since, you know, Lauren Southern entered politics in particular, there's been, you know, a mass shooting at a mosque in New Zealand and a shooting at a synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, a shooting in Texas in an effort to target Mexicans. All of those shooters left manifestos behind and all of those manifestos resembled very closely the language of the three individuals in the film. And you have to be careful because they're not citing Lauren Southern, not citing Mike Cernovich, but the point is that these individuals have created an atmosphere, have mainstreamed an ideology that younger people who are, you know, maybe more radical, more extreme, have nothing to lose, can then take it and, and run with it in the most violent way possible. And, you know, white domestic terrorism is now, according to pretty much every agency, the prevailing threat in the United States. We know their tactics. There is a, a retreat, a rebranding. And then a re-engagement. You know, as Lauren Southern, the lighting changes, the production values change. Then I guess most people just turn on Sky News and there she is. And she's just, you know, some of the old messaging is gone, but there she is as presentable as ever. And the old messaging is less gone than you'd think. I mean, she's reinvented herself as an anti-masker, a kind of a 
COVID denier, anti-lockdown. Her, her third film is a kind of a takedown of the BLM protest this summer, which many of us in the state saw as this amazing moment of racial progress, right? That we're finally having a reckoning. She saw it as a threat to you know, to the police and to the established order. And that's always been her skill and the skill of a lot of people in that space, not Richard Spencer, but, you know, winking at white nationalism without embracing it. And I think being a young woman, a woman who's as articulate as her, and I don't mean that in a complimentary way, but it's clearly part of her package. You know, you're able to suck people in by by dog whistling and winking and out without saying it. But the crux of everything she's saying and believes is about preserving white power and, and actually preserving white male power, which is, you know, especially strange considering what she went through. Richard Spencer, Mike Cernovich, Lauren Southern. Have any of them seen your movie? They have. Uh, they're not uh, they're not fans. What have they said? I can't go into too much detail. Uh, Lauren does not like it. But, you know, we stand behind every part of the reporting. It's rock solid. Like I said, went through a rigorous fact check. And we believe that it accurately captures her and portrays her well. I think it's difficult for someone as young as her to see her contradictions be so glaring and so obvious for all the film critics and, you know, many of the thousands of people who've watched the film. I think she's struggling with that. You know, Cernovich was not a fan, but in typical Cernovich fashion, he can spin it in all sorts of ways. So he didn't like it, but, you know, he didn't want to come off too aggressive. So he's, uh, you know, he was texting me pretty aggressively and has since mostly stopped. Richard, funny enough, like is so in his own universe that, I don't know that he's watched the film. He would text me like at two in the morning and say, hey, Daniel, how can I watch it? And I'd be like, Richard, it's it's online. You can stream. At first, he was at a film festival. I said, buy a ticket and then stream it. I haven't heard from him since. But I should say the broader alt-right has just attacked me with an insane amount of anti-Semitic hate mail since the film came out. One person made a video basically alleging that the Holocaust is a myth and my grandmother is a fake Holocaust survivor, even though she lost her entire family except for one brother. Um, so it has not it has not been a, a pleasant chapter of of my life um, because of them, but especially because of the people underneath them. Daniel Lombroso, thank you for talking with me today. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, this is something new for us. If you made it this far, uh, maybe it's working. We have been making podcasts for over ten years, but video is something new. If you want us to keep doing it hit subscribe to this channel. It will make a difference. You also might want to hit subscribe to our main channel and we're gonna be posting videos there, exclusive content that we are not putting anywhere else. Also, Canada Land is a audience supported news organization. We need people to support us directly and we have an incredible membership program. You'll get ad free versions of all of our podcasts. You'll get discounts and exclusive access to our merchandise. You'll get invites and early access and discounts to our live and virtual events. More than anything else, you will be keeping journalism alive in this country. To help us out, and we rely on it, go to canadaland.com join.